Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to Nixus Capital Markets Day. This uh, nice afternoon here at Keilaranta, Espoo. Uh, and happy to see that we have a almost full house, few, few uh, benches there left. My name is Petri Kairinen, I'm CEO of Nixu uh, since 2014 and been with the company 12 years already. Uh, this is our agenda for today. Uh, we will start with an uh, overview of cyber threat landscape. Then we will talk about cybersecurity market and Nixu in it, uh, Nixu financials and Nixu growth strategy, uh, followed by industrial IoT cybersecurity review. And we have a fellow speakers here. We have Andre Katri, our super ninja hacker, who will be <laughs> talking about the cyber threat uh, environment. Then we have our CFO, Janne Kärkkäinen, and our head of industrial IoT security, uh, Alexander Vara. And also our chairman of the board, Kimo Rasila, has, is here supervising us that we do a <laughs> proper job on this, this CMD. Uh, and this will be webcasted uh, directly and the materials and the recording will be available at the Nixu website at, under the investors uh, area. I think the material is actually the slide deck is there already, so we don't have any printouts. But if you want to connect with your digital mobile devices, then, then that's, that's uh, where you find, find the deck. Uh, but with no further ado, uh, let's start the Capital Markets Day. Thank you for coming here, and uh, Andre, you are okay. next. <laughs> so, um, see if the technology is working also. Yes, uh, as Petri said, my name is Andre. Uh, I joined uh, Nixu last year when uh, Nixu bought my company, Bitsec, that I started in Sweden uh, many years ago. Um, my background, uh, he called me a ninja hacker. Yes, I have been a hacker, I admit. But I've been a government hacker, uh, responsible, uh, among other things, to set up the cyber warfare unit in, in uh, the Swedish armed forces in Sweden. And also, or, or I also have a background from the Swedish uh, security services. So I've been working with uh, IT since 1985, and IT security in special since 1995, when I got an assignment to uh, build a network for the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Sweden. But uh, the network was in Moscow. So it took a bit, a, a while to do that. So I was there working for three years before I moved <laughs> to, to the security services instead. Uh, but yeah, that was a, a, a nice a place to uh, actually learn uh, IT security hands-on. So that's a bit about my background. Uh, if we look at what happened uh, during 2017 on, on, in, in this area, uh, cyber, uh, there was a lot of um, exciting things actually do, happening there. Uh, if you remember uh, the hacks for um, uh, NotPetya and, and WannaCry, uh, that was quite exciting. Uh, and I will do a uh, more in-depth analysis of one of these attacks of not Petya a bit later. Uh, but if we look at uh, the statistics, um, a lot of these crime uh, or cyber incidents are uh, financial motivated, uh, which makes it, it a bit easier when we do the, the, the investigations. Uh, a, a good <coughs> A good way to start an investigation is follow the money if, we, if you want to, to find who is behind uh, any, uh, uh, an incident. So uh, about 80% of, of, of all uh, incidents are financially motivated and, and the rest are espionage. Organized crime, of course, uh, because it's uh, financially motivated. A lot of these uh, incidents are, uh, are instigated by organized crime. Uh, an interesting fact is that um, at least very, very soon uh, claimed that it, takes, it took months or longer to discover uh, an incident. My understanding or, or, or my experience is that n the normal time for an in from an incident to discovery for a large corporation is about seven months. Uh, so it takes a long time to actually uh, to to actually 
for a company to actually notice that they have been attacked. Most of the of the uh, of the of the incidents uh, or of the or the uh, security breaches are non-targeted attacks, and that's because most of the incidents are opportunistic. If you look at a breach, the breach is uh, most often than not because there was an opportunity for the breach. There was a technical opportunity to do that. So therefore, anybody who uh, noticed that opportunity has the opportunity then to attack that target. Uh, but the statistic is not true when it comes to, uh, uh, to some uh, parts of, of, of the community where, for example, uh, governments are very, very targeted attacks. We, we can see that most of the attacks that are, are on the, of the government side, they are actually targeted. Uh, email is still the common, most common uh, attack vector for a targeted attack. Uh, about 80% of all people are not going to click on the link uh, for, uh, for uh, spam. But uh, statistics shows that 4% always do. So we, get, we should get this 4% fired, <laughs> and then we will fix the problem. But that, that is not so easy. And, 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 and another st interesting fact is that these 4% that actually uh, click on these links, they are more prone to do that once they have started doing that. People are strange. I, I can understand technology, but I can't understand people. <laughs> At least some people, and 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 still, the, and also an interesting fact is that the biggest impacts on, on companies are not loss, financial losses, or it is the business interruption. Uh, so actually, the monetary uh, losses are not uh, directly somebody stealing, uh, if, uh, somebody stealing money from companies. It's the the business interruption that is the, the highest cost for the industry. Uh, and in some uh, and in some cases, uh, reputation impact can be significant also for trust industry. But there are some ex exceptions to that. Uh, 2015, I did an investigation of, of a site called Ashley Madison. Anybody heard of that? It's a it's a big site in the, in in Canada that has like 40 million users. And there and there was a, a big. Uh, uh, yeah, they, they, they actually stole the, the, the whole database from, from, from Ashley Madison. But the most important, <laughs> well, the fun thing that we noticed that four weeks after the breach was uh, publicly known, the, uh, the, the, the revenue increased by 10%. I don't, I can't understand people. I understand technology. <laughs> But, uh, but as they say, uh, any commercial is a good commercial already. <laughs> so uh, they got a lot of attention. Um, so uh, what we see is, uh, we, yeah, of course, we had a lot of ransomware and fraud and so on. Uh, but we can see that that, I that is actually decreasing. And what is increasing now is stealing computer capacity. Uh, Ransomware, instead of, 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 of um, being used to, to encrypt people's uh, hard drives and, and want bitcoins for them, they, they steal your uh, processor uh, to mine bitcoins instead. So they make money directly instead of uh, waiting for the, 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 the payment for, from, the, from the victim. They make the victim work for them instead. So it's, it's a mu much better business model. Because then you get the pay, you get paid directly, and that's what we see right now. Uh, ransomware is declining; it's getting more difficult, uh, but the, the 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 mining is going up. Um, end users are being more aware, and that's why also ransomware is 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 declining. Uh, and also, technology is getting in place. Microsoft have fixed some of the client software. So it's not so easy for them anymore. But uh, the main thing is that people actually is making backups nowadays. And that was a good outcome, I think, of ransomware, is now that people are aware of making backups, having a backup of your data. 
So even if you get hit today by ransomware and somebody encrypts your data, it is just an interruption of your business because you probably will have some, some uh, uh, process of, of, of retrieving your data from a backup. And focus has also shifted from individuals to organizations now uh, because it's maybe easier to, to do that. Uh, another way around now, because people are getting backups, is the business model has changed a bit to extortion instead. So instead of uh, threatening not to give your information back, they are threatening to publish your information instead. So that's a, that's a shift in, in, the, in the business model. But um, the whole scene is actually now moving more against uh, 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 Bitcoin mining instead of, 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 uh, of encrypting hard drives. Uh, but they are f trying to find other territories, uh, hacking uh, other things, IoT stuff. Uh, you can just imagine what would happen if somebody is able to um, to break into the system for uh, a large hotel like uh, chain of hotels like the Hilton, and they will lock all the doors and then will say, "Give us ten thousand bitcoins and we will unlock all the doors for the whole chain." Uh, Maybe they will be successful, I don't know, but something to think about. Uh, also, um, the hackers or the pirates, or whatever, they are stealing uh, film material and then they are uh, extortioning uh, Netflix and Disney and so on. Uh, please give us bitcoins or we will uh, release the, these uh, uh, movies on to the internet. So that's also uh, trying to make money from extortion then. Uh, DEFCON is a secure, well, if you have not, not have heard about DEFCON, that's an IT security event every year in Las Vegas and has been going on for many, many years. A uh, lot of hackers uh, uh, meeting up in a conference in Las Vegas. Uh, I think now there are like these events now attract like 10,000 hackers at any given point. Uh, in 2004, I actually won all three of these competitions at DEF CON, so I was yeah, a hacker once, but then, uh, yeah, just, uh, this is um, uh, not Petea. The, uh, I, I was plan to, planning to show a film, but it was not possible. Uh, but anyhow, the, the, the clip here that was uh, going to show that the, the Ukraine police raiding the offices of, uh, of a company, the Intellect. Uh, oh, I don't know where I put my glasses, but in my hand. Uh, the Office of Intellect Service. It's a strange name for a company, Intellect Service. But that was a company that uh, was making a, a, a software, Amedoc, that was used uh, for dis distributing the NotPetya uh, attack. Uh, and, and the clip was from when the police actually raided the offices in Ukraine of that company. Uh, so you can't see that now, just uh, when they are entering. Uh, when, when we do investigations, it's not this dramatically. I would, well, in the past maybe, but not anymore. Uh, one of the company that was really hard hit uh, by uh, Petea, as they uh, claimed, uh, and, and then they discovered that it was not Petea, and that's why the word not stick and stuck, and now it's called not, not Petea, because it was not Petea. Uh, so, uh, Petya. So, uh, not Petya. They were hit by not Petya, and and they went out on 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 uh, Twitter, uh, actually uh, the day after or the, in the evening, uh, and and telling the world about uh, the that they had been uh, attacked. And I think that is quite good, actually, to be quite open with that, uh, not to try to hide uh, or not trying to hide the fact that you are being attacked. Uh, I, uh, I think the world would be better if everybody actually um, tells about these attacks and not try to hide them. 
but uh, they were they were hit by this very very hard uh, and because they are they are charge, in charge of 20% of all the freights uh, around globally in the world uh, and they have to move i think uh, a ship every 20 minutes and so on um, there there was quite a huge impact on on on, on their uh, on their business uh, they concluded that nothing was stolen, no information was leaked, and, and the cost for them was about $250 million for this incident. Uh, if we look at what, what is not Petea, um, and why, the, why was it so successful? Uh, it was successful because um, it used weaponized code uh, from the NSA, the National Security Agency, the US spy organization. And then you can think, okay, how could they do that? That was because uh, a hacker group uh, found these tools on the internet or on the server that was used by this organization uh, and then it was forgotten somehow. So it, it was leaked, these, uh, these tools uh, that were used by, and this leak was in, 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 in 2017. So they used these weaponized uh, tools that were leaked from the NSA, and they were quite successful in doing that. Um, when, they released the, when they actually released the data onto the internet, it took Microsoft uh, a couple of months uh, to um, to patch the, the the vulnerabilities, and the incident was also a couple of months after that. So there was ample time to actually fix the, the problems for the, the the exploits that were, that were released during uh, due to this uh, leak. Uh, but um, yes, uh, and and the code was also successful because it was not only uh, jumping from one user to the other, it was actually uh, jumping from a computer to another computer without any user interaction because it was a worm, it was not a virus. Uh, it, worms were quite popular in the beginning of the 2000, but then uh, the security for computers got much, much better. So actually making worms today is quite, quite, it's very, very difficult. But because they had tools from the NSA, uh, they, they, it was actually possible to do that. And that's why they, it could spread so very fast. And it also stole uh, administrative credentials. But uh, a strange thing was there was payload on it. So they, it encrypted the hard drive and it wanted the ransom. But actually there was no ransom to be paid. Even if you paid, you would not, uh, you would not get uh, the encryption uh, key for it because it was not designed to do that. It was designed to actually destroy, destroy the hard drive, but not destroy the hard drive, destroy the data on the hard drive. So the, the, the intention of the, of the NotPetya uh, network worm was not to get money, it was destruction. Uh, the method they used to, to uh, deploy uh, the, the NotPetya uh, network worm was through uh, a, a program called MEDOC. It's an accountant, uh, accounting software that you need if you are doing business in the Ukraine. Because if you do your tax returns in, in Ukraine, you need to do it in an electronic form. And there are only two programs, uh, and one of these programs that you can use, that, uh, use to do that is MEDOC, and they have like 80% of the market. Uh, and it's only used in Ukraine. Somebody took control over the servers uh, from the intellect, whatever uh, company in the Ukraine. So it actually owned the servers that were, were used to update the software. So through three of these updates, they actually, the attacker actually put in a backdoor into that software. So the first step of this attack was actually putting backdoors into 80% of all businesses in the Ukraine. Uh, and they were quite successful doing that. So for three months, they, have, uh, they had a backdoor into all MEDOC 
uh, instances uh, that were installed in the Ukraine. We call this a supply chain attack. It's not if you want to attack somebody, but you don't want to attack them directly. You, t you attack something that your target is using. So in this case, you know that the target was using this AmiDoc software. So instead of attacking the companies, you were attacking the AmiDoc uh, software supplier. Uh, so the threat actor was using the company intellect service to plant their network worm, Trojan. Uh, and that, they did that because they had the back door into the AmiDoc software. And from the computer, uh, it was just a, a, a process that was run by the AmiDoc software, which was a le legit, legitimate process. So uh, antivirus program could not stop that. So that was actually what happened. So who, who is the benefit from this then? NotPetya was designed to be destructive. It not, was not designed to make money. Uh, it was only targeting software was used inside the Ukraine. 80% of the, of the Ukraine businesses was using this software. And as I understand it, the Ukraine is still in a state of war with Russia. Uh, so I'm thinking cyber warfare. Anybody in this room disagree? I think it is a, it's a fair, even if I don't have any proof, it's a fair assumption to do that because they used a lot of good technology actually and, and, and they also uh, burned the possibility to use this, uh, this uh, advantage that they had because they had, 80, they had a backdoor into 80% of all Ukraine businesses that they could, they, they could have used that to do anything with that, stealing money or whatever. Uh, but that was uh, but that was not used to that. It was just used to deploy uh, these uh, types of uh, network worms. So I'm thinking cyber warfare. Maybe because I've been working in that area. But uh, anyhow. So collateral damage of cyber warfare. These are the three companies, uh, the big three companies outside uh, Ukraine that was quite heavily hit. Uh, by this attack. Uh, and you can think, okay, why Maersk then? Okay, they have business in the Ukraine that are directly connected, owned by Maersk, and, and probably they are in the same network. And I assume that it was quite a flat network because the, 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 the worm was so easily spread. So if you do business in Ukraine, have a, 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 a sub, if you have a company there and that's connected into your network, of course you were also hit by this. And I think that was the case with both Maersk and, and FedEx and, and, and Merck. Uh, but the, the, an, in, an interesting fact is uh, there was a, a, an application for a job uh, or uh, an announcement for a job opening at Maersk and, and one of the... Uh, uh, one of the demands were experienced in, in just the, in, in the, the, the software MedDoc. So, I think, um, yeah, hackers are always trying to, to find new, uh, to new openings. And I think GDPR will be a new opening, an opportunity for hackers too. Uh, but then extortion again. If you don't pay up because you have bad security, we will tell the world, and then you have to pay even more. Uh, but to summarize it a, a bit, uh, what I'm saying that uh, cyber threats continue to evolve while traditional threats are still the same. And it's not what, what I mean by that. It's uh, traditional crime will always be there and in the same amount. That just the, 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 the scene is just expanding into cyber also. So it's traditional crime plus cybercrime, so they are not shifting focus. Uh, but criminals and state actors are expanding into the, the cyber domain. Uh, and, and, and a problem that I see now that is cyber warfare is becoming a problem for everyone because as we saw Maersk and, and, and Merck and, and FedEx, they were collateral damage uh, in this cyber warfare. And that's 
uh, a huge problem now for society today. How do we protect ourselves against being collateral damage in a cyber warfare conflict? So, how much time? Okay, questions on that? No one? You have always a question, Kim. Perfect presentation. Yeah, but it's a, it's a statement. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, cyber is com becoming the, four, the fifth or fi fourth domain of, uh, of warfare. So, of course, the, and I'm, I'm, I'm a part of that, uh, guilty of building that too. Uh, but what we have to do, look into is how are we going to keep civilians outside the, the, the battle zone? And that's almost impossible because the battle zone is the internet. And the internet is all of us, the digital society. And, and that's what one of the Nixu creed is, protecting the di digital society. So that's, this is an, uh, an interesting uh, uh, challenge for us on how we can help the digital society with this. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, the question is, is, the, is, the, is, is the, the payments always done with, with bitcoins? And the answer is no, because there are different, there, are, there is Minero and, and, and other uh, digital uh, uh, currencies. But the, 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 uh, the majority of the extortion is made by this digital money, because they are not traceable. Uh, yes? Any more questions? It's yet of uh, any GDPR related uh, cases that, that could uh, arise. It, 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 what, what, what date is it? it the, the, the legislation was 25th, I think it started. And, uh, <laughs> and I think, I, I will think we will see, uh, it, we, it will take a while before we will, um, we will get there, but uh, I promise you, maybe we'll have an example next year. <laughs> Thank you. So? Oh, OK. Thank you, Andre. Let's give a big hand. Thank you, Andre. <laughs> and I uh, have to say that Andre, Andre had quite colorful presentation, but due to webcast reasons, we couldn't, we couldn't show show all the nice videos and so on that we had. We have to improve, improve to the next year. Uh, but from the cyber threats and that landscape, uh, I'll, I'll be talking a little bit more on cybersecurity market and, and where Nixu is positioned within that market space. And um, from the NotPetaya example that Andre, Andre was talking about, I think it's, it's quite fair to jump into this quote from Maersk, uh, logistics company chair of board, chairman of the board, Jim Hageman Snabes, a speech at World Economic Forum in 2018, where he, you know, obviously related to the Marsk incident and, and their like whole uh, ecosystem going down uh, due to this collateral damage from cyber warfare. And he said in his speech that there is a need for radical improvement in the infrastructure and collaboration between companies, technology companies, and law enforcement is needed to redesign the digital world because it's not resilient enough. To, to encounter these type of threats. And I, I've been in the industry 12 years myself and started in a sales role. And I have to tell that when selling to different companies, companies like Marsk typically were not the ones that were in the core forefront of uh, cybersecurity or information security investments because they were typically thinking that, yes, we have ships and containers. We don't really need any information security because they will, they will stay afloat. Uh, but I guess that times are changing. And that, as Andre said, is, is very nicely tied to the Nixu creed or vision statement mi or mission statement, the purpose of being that we keep the digital society running. That's a very, very uh, important uh, theme for all Nixuans because we see that unless we are there helping our clients and the society in general to stay secure against all these cyber threats, there, there will be no digital future. All that digital future will be 
let's say, more like uh, cyberpunk or, or matrix type of thing than, than a something that we would value and, and want to run for. So that's, that's where we are, and, and that's also why, why this whole market is so very, very interesting. There is no, as Marsk, as a very typical company of not being any interest in, in cybersecurity, is also thinking that, yes, digitalization is there. They need to become more digital. They need to build up their, their own practices for working in the digital world, and they need to be cyber secure. I think that's, that's very much driving force, force in this, this market. And if we think this change, uh, what has happened when we've changed uh, talking about information security into cyber security? There are, I think, these three main things, and uh, I've, I've used this slide for quite some time, so it, most of you have probably seen it, but I think it's still important to repeat that core message that from office support systems we are moving into digitalized, digital business transformation, becoming industrial internet driven digitalized business. And that's, of course, one of the key themes of today's. Uh, Capital Markets Day and our, our refreshed strategy as well. Uh, today, uh, Wärtsilä had their Capital Markets Day this morning uh, here in Helsinki, and I think one of their key themes that their digitalization, tra digital transformation is increasing at Wärtsilä at the same time. So they are pushing towards their engines being IoT connected and, and, and truly, truly providing added value for their, uh, their own clients. And of course, when they are connected, they are not just diesel engines and the ships anymore, they are computers that are sailing. And then business is, is reliant on those computers. Uh, there's also a paradigm shift on how you do security. So from walled garden type of perimeter defense, you are moving into a world where there is no true perimeter anymore. You are connected to different partners, you are doing constantly uh, merchants and acquisitions, and you have cloud services and uh, mobility to your networks, where you need to cut holes into your perimeter defense. So you need to rethink your security. There is no black boxes that would make you secure. You need to th rethink everything on software level and at process level on how you, are, how you are building that security. And then the threat landscape is changing, as Andrea was talking about. Random viruses, we are moving into targeted attacks, which are business-driven or some other motivation like warfare-driven attacks, which are, of course, much harder uh, to prevent. So the key market drivers for cybersecurity, as we, as we see it, are uh, the digitalization of business altogether. And there isn't really, I guess, very few uh, top companies in the world anymore who wouldn't be saying that digitalization and becoming digital and enabling digital business wouldn't be one of their key strategic goals. So they are pouring money and they are investing into that. And while they are doing that, there is obviously more money in the digital business and that drives the cybercrime. So, you know, where there's money, there will be criminals and, and they are trying to benefit from it. And of course, after crime happening and, and digitalization of business, regulators will be there as well. And as GDPR uh, showed us uh, during last week, I guess, if you didn't know about GDPR before last week, if you have read your emails, I'm pretty sure that now you know, know about GDPR, or at least you've got a lot of, lot of emails about it. So, so now, now everyone is aware. Uh, uh, and that funny thing was actually that GDPR didn't require you to get all of those mails. I think that was more like hasty, hasty thinking by, by the marketers sending all, all of that out. But what GDPR does require is, is that you have a uh, right for your consent for different services, which actually requires that all digital services are kind of redesigned to think on the privacy principles. And that work is definitely not done in, in any companies yet. So there's a lot of work to be done in redesigning the systems that process consumer data. Uh, there's also, also uh, the, uh, the disclosure of breaches, which is a very important thing. Uh, most of the breaches uh, about consumer data go still undetected or they are not even reported to the police because there is no benefit for the company to actually report report these crimes. But now with uh, GDPR, and if you lose personal information data, you are obliged to inform within 72 hours of that breach. So I would expect that one of the kind of the first things is not the actual sanctions that will follow from breaking GDPR, but uh, the kind of notices of breaches happening uh, for those companies that are breached and companies are breached increasingly. And then, of course, the regulation will not stop there. There is also, also new regulations. There's e-privacy regulation in the EU, uh, since there's this directive already that's controlling the, the critical infrastructure providers and so on. So there will be more and more regulations 
that are forcing, forcing uh, companies to do things differently, considering cybersecurity and privacy. And that's, of course, again, a, a force, force in this field. And my, my personal guess would be that, that if you look at any electric device nowadays, we can see that in European market there's the CE marking uh, saying that it's certified uh, in electricity device, uh, that it's it's a uh, it's good thing. And I would expect that at some stage, not maybe not maybe during the next few years, but at some time there will be some sort of cybersecurity certification demanded on all, all IoT products uh, for home use or so on, for consumers' protection. Oops. Okay. Uh, the picture is a little bit small. Sorry, sorry about that. Uh, but the rapidly growing services market, uh, we have a market size of about 80, 84 to 89 uh, billion dollars and a market growth of 8% of, uh, per year estimated on, on, on the last uh, three years from 2014 to 2017. For the future, it's really hard to predict on the actual, actual figures that we will see. Uh, there are the kind of the different uh, estimates are, are really differing on that, that perspective, but they are typically ranging sort of somewhere from 8% to 20% per year as a market growth overall in services. So these market factors are def definitely driving, driving growth and, uh, and uh, things are happening. But it is still a very new market, very unmature market. So I think the analysts are also struggling on how to actually get any beneficial data. And I think this is a, you know, one of those things that I've been struggling as well that, you know, when addressing investors that, okay, what is the total accessible market and how large is Finnish market, how large is Swedish market and what are the different areas and that, that data is really hard to come, come by. Or at least the data that I would believe myself is really hard to come by. And uh, but this is a, a report from Vision a, a, a UK research agency so, uh, talking about professional and managed services growth uh, worldwide uh, between 2017 and 2027. And that is like 20% growth increasing uh, to the kind of the later, later years. And the funny thing is that they, they've come up in their analysis that both the professional services and the managed services part are, are growing rapidly. So there is no like like uh, one part that would, would be uh, mostly growing or, or gaining the most, most growth. The market is, is uh, dominated by, well, let's, let's say not dominated, but also scattered by very different players in the market. Uh, there is a, a group of generalist players, like the telecom providers in each country typically, the IT integrators, and then the consulting and audit companies, the big four companies. All of these typically have a certain teams providing cybersecurity services as well in their own range. And of course, for all of these, it's typical that cybersecurity is not their key focus. Uh, and uh, it's, it's kind of in the, well, more or less independent part, part of their operations. And then on the, on the right hand side of the slide, uh, we have the cybersecurity specialists, where the technology vendors are the ones that are developing their own technologies during the R&D uh, and designing new technologies to the world. Uh, then in the middle, there are managed security service providers who are providing this as a service over the network. Uh, you could talk about cloud-based security services and so on. And uh, typical for them is that they, they don't typically have their own consultancy workforce, or at least not so large consultancy workforce. So it's more like buy, buy, buy it from the internet type of, type of thing. And then there are the dedicated cybersecurity service companies, which is Nixu. Nixu is one, one of the examples on European scale. There is, for example, NCC Group in, in Britain uh, and also elsewhere in Europe and, and the States and SecureLink, uh, which is a venture capital owned company. And these type of companies also come from a li little bit different backgrounds, uh, whereas Nixu comes from a pure consultancy play. The SecureLink, for example, is, is a, let's say, box mover type of company. So used to be selling, selling firewalls uh, and, and, and infrastructure equipment and building the services and consultancy on top of that, whereas we have been coming from the, from the advisory consultancy side and moving, moving to those, towards the services business. Any, any questions or comment, comments at this stage? <coughs> No. And the picture, whole picture of, of European scale is that, that this is still a very fragmented market and there is no clear European leader. 
And uh, that's, that's very interesting because that was the fact when we started our, our this current strategy phase in 2014 and we set the goal of being, being the North European go-to partner for cybersecurity services and we felt that there was no, no clear leader in that space. And that's still the case. We don't, we don't claim to be the leader yet, uh, but at the same time there is no such company who would claim that position or truly, truly be in that position. And most of the market is sti still very scattered. So though there are, of course, a lot of business going in these generalists in the, in the earlier uh, slides, but there are also a lot of small companies in all of the countries in Northern Europe that are these type of boutique security companies ranging from uh, 10 to 20 to 50 to 100 people, but hardly, hardly larger, larger than that. So they typically don't have the muscle or you know, wish or, or means to scale their business larger than that. And companies within the range of, of where Nixu is nowadays, there is it's not that many, many companies around. And where are we typically today? Um, so we were, you know, uh, those of you who don't know Nixu at all, we were founded in 88. This is our 30th anniversary. Uh, great year uh, to be alive and, and lots, of, lots of different happenings around the years. Uh, of course, I'm, I'm most talking about what happened after 2014 when we got publicly listed on Nasdaq First Note listing. Uh, we are technology vendor independent, partner for enterprises, meaning that we are their trusted advisor in, in many senses. We don't have our own technologies, but we are relying on the technologies of other, other companies uh, in helping the clients to implement and, and design those or offer them as a service to our clients. We have over 300 professionals in European area right now, which is actually quite formidable expertise pool already which also tells you how, how small this business still is, that, that with 300 people you can be already in formidable position. And we have the luxury of being trusted by large enterprises. Nixon had a history of working with Nokia for many years uh, in the Nokia's greatness times uh, and still working with them. But that, of course, gave us the, the uh, understanding of how to work with large companies. And in Finland, we are already working with over 60% of the top 100 companies. And in Sweden, we are fast, fast getting in the same, same type of position, so working with many of the large companies. And that's, that's of course, very, very interesting position. And right now, we are serving like 400 clients last year. And I'm, I'm typically saying that we could easily lose the, the smallest 100 clients in that list and then concentrate our clientele, but get more more business from the, from the larger clients on that list. We have local presence in Finland, Sweden, the Netherlands, United States and, and Romania currently. And if you look at our geographical distribution, um, you can see that those are the locations and 65% and of our revenues last year, 32 million euros came still from, from Finland based clients, uh, but 35% already from international clients. And this has been a huge increase, which I, I will later uh, talk about. And we have four main, main uh, delivery types. Uh, projects and assignments is still the core. So, so coming from a consultancy world, world we, we work on projects and assignments. We typically don't do resource hiring, so, so we don't just send people to work at the client 100%. So it's more like uh, delivering something of value to the client and then in teamwork type of environment and many of our consultants are working with many clients at the same time. Uh, and that's the diminishing part uh, from, from our revenue. And the, the increasing part which we have during this strategy period increased quite a lot are the continuous services and managed security services which are both recurring revenue in their type, meaning that they, they have continuous agreements and that, that the revenue is, is continuing. Uh, from year to year. And the managed security service to 7%, that's the scalable part, part from the business. And the 3% from licenses and hardware are the, the, uh, the money that's being sold to other, other people's uh, licenses, other companies' licenses as part of our solution deliveries to the clients. Janne will, will go a little bit more on how this development has happened in his, in his presentation, so I'm not going too deep in that. Our aim has been and, and still is to be the holistic partner for high-end cybersecurity services. And this is the story that I've been telling, telling our clients is that we, we need to, uh, or they need to adapt to the digital transformation in a way that they need a new breed of partners. They need a partner that's able to help them in cybersecurity that is a, a holistic 
uh, reach, so to say. So it's not coming from any one vector. It's not coming from IT vector or telecom vector or a audit vector, but you need a dedicated partner for that. And there's a couple of reasons for that. There's one reason is that that partner should have visibility into what's happening on cybersecurity field across the whole company, but also the thing that, that when that partner is independent, that doesn't create jealousy with their other providers. Because cybersecurity world work is never done in, in some isolation. It's always connected to the client's other partners. And for, for the IT vendors, for example, if, if you would have outsourced your IT as a client to CJI, for example, I, I presume it would be quite hard to get Tieto in to provide uh, the, the cybersecurity services and be guiding CJI on how they should be working on their, on their outsourced IT. So, so I think there is a definite tension uh, between the IT vendors in that type of things, where Nixu, as a independent company, has much easier to, to gain that access and, and, and work there as a collaborative partner. Um, the top three solutions parts, the industrial internet, corporate IT, corporate and IT security and digital business show the segments, the client segments that we have uh, been working in this strategy period. Most of the business is still coming from corporate and IT security, which is traditional internal uh, network setting and internal systems of the companies. But we have already for three years uh, been focusing increasingly on this industrial internet, the, the operational technology side, and then the digital business, meaning the uh, digital uh, e-commerce fronts of our clients and di different decision makers in that area. And today we released a strategy announcement telling that these are actually the two segments that we will be mostly focusing in the future. So obviously we will uh, still work with corporate and IT security, but most of our services will be developed towards those, those two segments, where other, which are actually the ones that are getting, getting the most investments and funding, funding at our clients as well. And the good thing is that the service portfolio, the white areas in this presentation are actually the ones that are relevant to all of these segments. So, so the kind of the work that we are doing is not so different for different segments, but the means and how to get there and the, how to understand the client's needs are different in these different decision makers. And most of the services we are trying to offer as a service basis, meaning that it's continuous. It's an agreement that will run for a longer period of time and include uh, technologies as well as consultancy services. And I will, I will address all of that uh, in the later, later presentation as well. Good. That was ending my, my part of the presentation. So cybersecurity market and uh, Nixu place in it. Any, any questions or comments before we let Janne Kärkkäinen to continue with his presentation? I'm, I'm quite often asked that what is our target setting for, for the managed security services uh, part, so, so which percentage should that be? And, uh, and I, I've said that we don't have a clear goal for that because I'm, I'm thinking more in absolute amounts than, than uh, percentages of our revenue. So all of these are profitable in itself, so, so there is no need to kind of drive one, one part above the other. So if we have the projects and assignments growing at a very fast pace, uh, and then, then the managed security services won't be able to grow as fast or that much faster than those, then, then I'm happy to have that share there. But obviously we would expect that to, that to raise, you know, maybe something around 50% of our revenue um, in, in the, kind of the coming years. That's the expectation. But at the same time, the other, other parts are growing as well. So, so this is no like uh, legacy business. All, all of that business is actually quite relevant to our vision and mission statements. Good, but uh, if no further questions at this stage, I'll, I'll let Janne, Janne on to the stage. Thank you. And we'll have a short break after Janne's presentation. So, so hold on for a few more minutes. Yeah, that might be needed after <laughs> seeing the numbers. But I trust that uh, now in the audience, we, not, we have lots of people who likes the numbers. So my presentation might, be, might not be as colorful as, as Andres works. But my name is Janne Kärkkäinen. I'm the CFO of the company. I've been that since 2016. And what I wanted to go through with you in my presentation was to go briefly about our key, key financial KPIs and, and performance indicators and then uh, 
a brief uh, look at uh, the Nixu journey as, as a listed company. So uh, KPIs of main focus. So obviously we keep ourselves as, as being a, a growth growth company and that that's certainly what we are measuring and the revenue growth during the past four years have been around around 30 percent uh, and that's that's coming both from organic and, and non-organic growth so uh, during 16 and 17 we've done four acquisitions that that obviously have boosted our growth but also our organic growth has been has been on good level for example last year from our 50% growth, half of that was coming from, from organic growth. Uh, share of revenues outside Finland, obviously we are looking for growth also uh, outside Finland and, and that's where our acquisitions have been as well and that, that has boosted our, our revenues. So before 16, before we, we started to enter the, the uh, markets, uh, like more aggressively outside Finland, uh, the revenues outside Finland was around 6% and now last year it was already 35%. So there has been a big, big growth. Uh, biggest market out of that 35% uh, share is, is Sweden, where we, where we have done already uh, three acquisitions and, and then the next uh, markets uh, for us, the next biggest are, are Netherlands, where we have also done one acquisition and started our green fee operations and then the US, US market. Uh, the revenues by service type, this was something that we started to report last year when we moved to IFRS reporting and Petri also went through with you the, the four categories. Uh, we four out of, uh, uh, we mainly use these, these three categories, but the total continuous services as Petri presented, that includes uh, the managed security services and, and uh, the continuous services. Uh, the total continuous services, that grew by 118% last year, and, and the uh, managed security services actually grew by 168%, and that was really the kind of the highest, highest growing uh, service service uh, in, in our, our uh, portfolio. Uh, revenue breakdown per customer is also asked every now and then from us and, and that's uh, quite, quite uh, balanced in the way that the, the revenues are scattered among, among the customers. The uh, top three customers are uh, having the share of re their share of revenues is around, around 4%. And, and really the top 10 customers taking the 31% share of the total revenues. The total of, uh, amount of customers is, is over, over 400. Uh, then about our profitability. Uh, the profitability uh, at the same time as we have been growing fastly, our profitability during the past three uh, half year period has been has been going down as the profitability in our in the operations outside Finland is is less than less than in Finland. So last uh, last year second half our EBITDA profitability was uh, two and a half percent and and uh, around three percent uh, adjusted EBITDA. Uh, and in the adjusted items we count the MTA costs and uh, and the listing now the project that we. Uh, have ongoing is the moving to the main list, so the cost relating to that. And there's also other other efforts, growth efforts like our our digitalization efforts and building new service concepts and so on. Uh, well, our balance sheet it looks strong. This was the uh, end of last year's status, so equity ratio over fifty percent and uh, net. Yes, net interest bearing debt was around 3.4 3 million euros negative. And that was the financing situation overall was very much supported by the share offering that we did uh, October uh, uh, last, last year, October. So I guess we can fairly state that the balance sheet is in, in fairly good position and en enabling our growth strategy. 
Uh, then from finances, uh, uh, quick look to our journey as a uh, first not listed company, as Petri told, we were uh, we entered the first North list end of 2014, and now, as, as we have announced, we are now looking forward to move to the main list, main list uh, uh, of, of the Helsinki Stock Exchange list. So let's have a look how our journey looks so far. So the share price, price development uh, that has has developed since the since. Uh, uh, the listing to the first note, the, the price was 4.4 4 euros, and now, like two days ago, it was 11, uh, 11 euros 65 cents. So, and especially during the past two years, we can see compared to the, let's say, the average uh, Helsinki index, it has been uh, developing clearly, clearly better than that. So, a positive share price development and also the volumes down there we can see that that always the share volume has also been uh, growing in in line with the price uh, also number of shareholders since ipo uh, after the I ipo we had around 700 uh, owners and and just the uh, beginning of this month we had uh, a bit more than 3,000 owners and shareholders, so 4.3 times more than, than right after the IPO. So certainly the ownership base have been, have been growing, growing during these years. Then who are our owners? So this is the list of uh, 10 biggest owners. Well, 10 biggest, I must say that I don't know whether that's exactly 10 biggest owners because we have uh, Nordea and, and SCB there with the nominee registered holders. So obviously we don't know what's what's behind there, but but in the uh, counting those as one, the ten biggest takes around 42 percent of the of the owning, and, and there are also institutional owners as as Varmain and Ilmarinen, for example. Also, what what has been uh, important uh, for the company is, and its culture is that also the personnel and the, and the management are owning the company and, and it's, they are quite strongly in, involved in the, in the share owning in the way that, that during the past around four years we have, we've had two share issues for our people and we have also an uh, employee fund in the company and while, while the employee fund uh, many of the Nixuans are, are owning the shares as well. So, so that's about the shareholding and, and about the Nixu journey, journey as a listed company. And, and that, that was actually my brief presentation about these topics, but, uh, but I think we have some, some time for, for the questions as well. So would you have some, some questions relating to these topics or? Yep, there. Given your net cash position, what is your view as a CFO? How much uh, M&A firepower does the company have at current? And if, if a bigger target would come, would you then you, you say equity issue or other means to, to fund that? Yeah, if we think of what we've done in the history, we, we've kind of used both. We've used equity and, and we have also raised, raised some loan money. So, so obviously all the elements are, are valid in the future as well and, and depending also what kind of cases might might come come ahead of us so so i think uh, not not perhaps going deeply to your question but but that's that's how we've worked so far and i think that's probably the val valid financing strategy going forward as well if that at least it has worked well so far Any other questions? Maybe at this stage, it's also also good to note on our journey that we've, we've uh, uh, raised our interest into moving in the main exchange list at the Helsinki Stock Exchange. And in the past Nixu uh, annual general meeting, the, the uh, owners gave the board the permission to go yeah. proceed with those plans. And then we are, we are proceeding. And obviously, we'll, we'll uh, inform the market when, when the kind of the 
the uh, thing is there, but we are looking at the kind of summer summer timeline, and uh, and we are looking to do it as a technical list transfer. So so we are not the gas position, as Janne said, is, is quite good right now. So so there is no uh, immediate need for for raising new new capital. Good. Do we have any it other questions, or do we feel the time for a coffee break? If, if no further questions, let's let's have a, a break. We are a little bit ahead of the schedule, which is always nice nice to note. So so let's take a let's say 15 minute break and, and continue 15 15 over to finish time. And our webcast viewers will have a wonderful elevator music. I'm I'm told to <laughs> listen during that time. Thank you. And um, those who are following us through webcast, uh, remember that you have a possibility of asking questions in the webcast channel as well. And our gentleman from Inderes uh, at the back row tweeting about the event as well will be, will be asking those questions at the end of the presentation. So don't hesitate to shoot your questions. And uh, I guess they can be either in English or Finnish or, or maybe some other exotic language as well. And, uh, and our gentleman will translate that to English and we will answer those. Uh, regarding the other schedule, so we are now running a little bit ahead of time, uh, but once we finish there will be question and answers part and then there will be light, uh, light dinner served at this room. And uh, those of you who want to visit Cyber Defense Center, which is most of you, uh, we will distribute into two groups. And the first group will, will go into Cyber Defense Center immediately at 4 o'clock and that's like sharp. So, so you might not have time to have your dinner beforehand. So you go there first, and when you come back, you can, you can eat here. And then when the first group is back, like 15 over 4, then the next group uh, is able to visit, visit CDC. So that's, that's the plan forward. Uh, but hey, uh, thank you for attention. And now we are continuing into Nixus growth strategy towards 2020 and uh, the refreshed part of it. And, uh, and to look back a little bit in the kind of the early history and uh, Kimmo joined Nick support I think in, in 2004 and, and or relates 2005 or something like that and, and but that's been quite a journey where we started and, and it's always always good when you are thinking about the future it's good to know, know the past and the history as well. Uh, and the kind of the auditor part is obviously the part where Nixu is coming from so being a independent cybersecurity auditor doing audits finding vulnerabilities uh, telling our clients how they could be uh, solved and how they should be mitigated these vulnerabilities. And uh, I joined in 2006 and at that time we were doing our strategy phases and at that time we actually launched Nixo Tiger Team service where we took more responsibility of the client's uh, security management. So we were moving towards this advisor type of role, being there more for the client, also working together. And then we also instigated a a saying from judging to healing, meaning that our intent as cybersecurity professionals or at that time IT security professionals need to be to help the clients to be more secure, not to stop them from what they are doing and, and telling how, how bad they are. So it's very, very important point. Then a few years later, we started also building implementation. So implementing different security technologies and architectures to our clients, most notable the identity and access management solutions. So we started implementing them. And now, uh, during this strategy period, we've been moving into the uh, role of a holistic services partner. So instead of projects and assignments, trying to sell everything as a service, as a continuous relationship with the client. Also, of course, implementing, advising, and still auditing as well. But to have that as a more continuous track. And I think this has been quite a journey. It's taken uh, time. It's, it's an evolvement. But I think we've been quite successful in, in moving into that. And the beauty of this type of track is actually that, that we've always been in a position of trust with our clients. So we worked there, they uh, acknowledged our experience, our talented people, and the reputation with those clients that we are working is very good. And also the, the uh, recurrency of the business within the clients is, is very good. And I think that's, that's a beauty, beauty in that type of role. There are some, some computers in the area which are coming more from, let's say, box moving business, so selling solutions like like firewalls and so on, which are very sales-oriented culture, and you are selling 
solutions to your clients and you might have a relationship at the sales level but you are not actually into consultancy, not in the advisory, so maybe the trust level is not, not that high. And these companies are also moving into the services market and, and offering as a service, but having a little bit different, different track. And I, I think we, we are enjoying this position of trust with our clients. And those who have seen me present before know, know this slide quite well. So this is the strategy since 2014 when we said the vision to be the trusted go-to partner for cybersecurity services in Northern Europe and the best place to work for cybersecurity professionals. And we laid out three strategic initiatives, internalization, uh, which we started in 2015. We first started uh, with the Greenfield operations in Netherlands. So, so we hired a country manager and started hiring consultants in the Netherlands. And uh, the big thing for us was that are we able to hire good consultants? Are we, are we able to hire talent that's, that's equivalent to the Finnish talent that we have? because we don't have the existing brand reputation and so on. And it turned out that we actually were successful. The story of what Nixu is doing, the culture, company culture and, and the company heritage was, was really uh, appealing to these consultants. But what had been harder is actually opening the market, getting the clients, uh, you know, really getting a market presence similar to what we were enjoying in the Finnish market. And that led into the thinking of actually moving more into m a uh, related strategy to opening new markets. And, and since that, uh, we've done five mergers and acquisitions, uh, or acquisitions. We, we first uh, acquired the Finnish Panorama Partners 2014 in Finland before the IPO. And after that, uh, we've acquired three companies in Sweden and one in Netherlands, giving us market positions. Already in Sweden, we are one of the largest teams, as Janne mentioned, uh, in the Swedish marketplace. And all of the three companies are actually complementing uh, each other quite nicely. So they are representing the different services that we, at Nixo Finland we already had. So that's, that's quite nice. Obviously, uh, building one Nixo, so, so we are merging these entities together. We are, we are dropping their existing brands and then we are moving under one Nixo brand in all of the locations. It's, and that, that is hard work. So there needs to be things done. There needs to be systems brought together. Uh, there needs to be, you know, sales efforts, marketing efforts, all of that put together and that, that takes it all as well. But I think we, overall we've been quite successful and the most important thing is that we've been able to keep the people within the companies quite nicely. Of course there is some change always but, but it's been overall quite well. I remember when we started this m &A journey and I was, I was terrified as hell about, about buying a company and losing everyone the next day and, and getting fired the second day. So, so that was... That was the fears, but it turns out that, that when you have a good culture, when you are able to have a story that people feel, feel that they want to join, we are getting, getting new family members like Andre, Andre joining, joining the company. And where are we right now? We have grown from around 3% of revenue outside of Finland into the unnecessary showing the figure 35% uh, outside of Finland, which I think is, is quite substantial when Finland has been growing at the same time at a very, very fast, fast pace. Then the second strategic initiative was the developing of scalable services where we said that we are not going to be a consultancy house anymore but we will develop as a service and even more we are developing scalable services which means that they are technology based, they don't require man hours or uh, adding of man hours every time when we, when we get new clients. And I think we were you know, below 1% in our uh, share of managed services and growing mainly with the Nixo Cyber Defense Center into the, which was founded in, in 2015 into a 7% of the total revenues again. And as Janne mentioned this last year, that part was growing 168%. So it's, it's growing much faster than the, than the other parts of, of Nixu. And the best cybersecurity team having and being able to keep the team members, we've grown from less than 100 people to over 300 professionals in, in a three main locations and, and then Romania and USA in addition to that. In Finland we have about 200 people right now, in Sweden about 70, in, in the Netherlands about 40, 40 and so on. And our mid-range guidance has been uh, with that strategy, strategy period that, that we would grow over 15% per year and maintain an EBITDA of over 10% of the turnover, which were kind of based on the, on the ratio where we were when we launched this, this strategy. Uh, path. And, and obviously right now when you are looking at history you can see that we've been growing much faster than the 15%. So the, uh, 
annual average was about 30 percent, I guess Janne, Janne showed. At the same time, of course, our EBITDA has, has dropped and that's been a, a strategic investment into that growth. And we've seen that right now is the right time to make those investments and, and gr grow fast. And of course, we are right now in a position where Finland is, is, uh, is the most profitable part of the organization and, and funding the international expansion as well. But the most, most important thing in this, this aspect is that we are able to keep uh, the ratio of salaries and prices in, in level. And I think all the other, you know, that money that comes between that ratio can always be invested into growth in, in different things. And I, I will come back to when we are talking about our strategy, what are the things that we are, we are investing currently. So uh, when we were designing or refreshing this strategy, we were looking at the megatrends of how we see things progressing towards and past 2020. And of course, you can say that in, in there are in three main areas, socioeconomics, the client business and the technology, technology uh, front. And in socioeconomics, of course, you can say that U EU and USA are declining at the rise of Far East is happening. Uh, at the same time, there are increasing national tensions uh, and cyber war, as Andre was saying, is, is taking place. There are also clear signs of, of creation of national internets, which is quite, let's say, a, a threatening uh, view from the viewpoint of global enterprises that need to operate across, across all the countries. Uh, and at the same time, in kind of, let's say, employee market, there's the individualism of the young and appreciation of modern workplace cultures and so on is happening. Uh, there's the client business, where we see that, that uh, there is a definite rise of digital business models, uh, CDOs on the commercial side and, and CTOs on the more technology side, uh, commanding increasing budgets and trans digital transformation budgets. Whereas the traditional IT, uh, of course, still commanding budgets, but is more, more in a, let's say, cost cutting or, or uh, operational efficiency type of mode, where there is hard to get money, money for, for increasing security, for example. But at the same time, the cyber threat is increasing due to increasing digital footprint. And what's happening on the technology side, of course, everything as a service, so the SaaS model and cloudification in general, l the machine learning, artificial intelligence a little bit later, and the big data prevailing, and that leads to global platforms prevailing. So those platforms that are able to collect most of the data will probably be prevailing in that, that, uh, that game. Of course, there will be different platforms and there might not be one cloud to rule over them all, but the definitely the kind of the big technology companies, typically American companies, will have a, a big presence with their increased capability and capacity in there. So this is the kind of uh, platform where we started our, our thinking. And when you think of data economy, uh, as a consumer, uh, there upfront you you are encountering, or as a customer when you are when you are visiting some e-commerce or digital business, you are encountering the front-end systems and you are asked to give data. So so this is the where you are asked for your consent. So you add, you give your data uh, freely. Let's say Facebook, and uh, and that's feed into the new business models, data brokering, production, product development. Uh, parts and there, there you need GDPR requires that you give your consent. But at the same time, of course, uh, on different digital platforms, they have sensor profiling tools, cookies on your websites that are collecting data without you ever even acknowledging that. And when these two streams of data are combined together, then you get into these new business models and what can you can you do about that? And that same is happening both within the consumer world, which of course this picture is more talking about. And, uh, but also in the industrial IoT world, where you are collecting the data. And on the consumer front, with the digital identities, we see that the, the securing of this type of business model, <coughs> making sure that the data is efficiently created, but it's still compliant with the rules and regulations, and that, that databases are, are sufficiently protected, I think that's a huge opportunity for companies like us to be, be tapping into that, that data economy. And our, our client promise on, on that field with this new strategy has been digitalization done right. And, and the message with that promise is that there are lots of companies promising our clients to do digitalization and they are doing it. But then how to do it right? How to make sure that you are GDPR compliant? How to make sure you don't lose your client data? 
how to make sure that everything works even when, when not Petaya hits, hits your network. That's where we come into play and that's what we promise our clients that, that we help, help you to do it. Obviously we are not doing it alone, so we need the clients other digitalization partners. We need to be collaborating very strongly with them, but we need to be part of that ecosystem in order to make that happen securely. And uh, Nixu has traditionally had these two, two kind of little bit separate areas, this hardcore technical security and management security work, and then digital identity, uh, added and access management work, which used to be s uh, separate areas in a way that they had separate buyers within the client organization and so on. So there was some, some benefits, but it was not really, really tied together. But now with the rise of privacy and uh, privacy regulations, we are suddenly seeing that these are to coming together. So when we are talking about consumer databases, the digital business of our clients, we are suddenly there in the sweet spot, being able to combine identity, security and privacy and being there. We actually hired our, our first privacy lawyers within the past two years as well. So, so we now have a privacy lawyer consultancy practice as well. Uh, and, and combining these competencies together and working to the client to make sure that their data is secured and protected is, is actually a very, very nice promise. And there are very few companies in the European scale that is able to combine all of these aspects together. The traditional hardcore security companies typically miss the identity and access management parts, might have some privacy parts, but, but don't have it. Any, any questions or comments at this stage? And when we are talking about holistic services, uh, we want to have three layers available for the client. Cybersecurity governance, being the trusted advisors, the trusted advisors on how you do things, how do you meet your end goals, how you are not just protecting and preventing, but how to kind of drive that your business goals get, uh, get fulfilled. And of course, on the tactical level, it means operations management, which is typically uh, involved with people, processes, ways of working, all of that, where you, of course, need consultancy services. And you also need, need some technology-based services. And then there's the cyber defense, the hardcore security, where you know these spam breaches are happening, and then you take incident response when, <laughs> when uh, the attacks are happening in order to prevent them. And our, our promise to the clients is that we are not working on any one of these, these layers. We want to provide the whole, whole kind of approach to the clients as a service package. And the size that we are having and the capabilities that we are having is actually now proving that we can actually reach, reach this goal and this model. Uh, on the, during the break, we, we published a, a contract that was signed, signed today, this morning, uh, regarding a, a uh, cybersecurity partnership in the area of, again, industrial IoT, but also IT with a long-lasting company that we've been working, working for many years, uh, a global manufacturing company and that uh, deal size for, for estimated three years of time was 3.9 million euros and, and that's kind of I can tell that agreement that when I started as a head of sales of Nixo I could only, only imagine about so so now we've suddenly gained into space where we are able to sell larger more holistic uh, solutions to our clients and we have the credibility to be to be uh, to be partner for that and in, in that we don't have the you know, permission to use the client name yet, but I can tell that in that game, we were competing against global, big global names uh, to win, win that deal. So it's not, not regional contest anymore. And that leads, leads to our vision statement, which is only a little bit refined. So, so there are the main components are still there, but what we added is the for digitalization there. So, so when we are looking at the whole Northern European space, uh, we are saying that we don't actually, uh, we want to serve the clients, of course, holistically, but we are most interested about the digital transformation and how can we help them outside the traditional IT security. Of course, we want to help them in the IT security as well, but the focus of our, our strategy will be in the digitalization attempts and, and so on. And what that means, is that, that if this is the segment division on the left side that we've been now fulfilling, that most of the business has been coming from the corporate IT of our clients, and then a sizable chunk from the digital business, but and the industrial IoT has been there and growing. In the future, we hope that the corporate IT uh, will be the smallest part, and digital business and industrial IoT parts will be, will be growing much faster. Uh, 
obviously we don't want the corporate ID to diminish either, but the whole whole cake to be growing. So, so we are not throwing anything away. We are not stopping any operations, but the main focus of our development activities will be on services that are serving to these two segments, so digital business and industrial IoT. And after my presentation, Alexander Vara will be talking more about the industrial IoT and how we see that market and, and how does it differ from the, from the corporate IT, IT work. Uh, we have in the refreshed strategy, we have four strategic themes, cybersecurity talent community, cybersecurity partner for digitalization, data-driven services built on platforms and expanding market presence. And I will, I will go each one of them a little bit in, in more detail through right now. Uh, cybersecurity talent community, of, of course, is very much related to the best workplace for cybersecurity professional goal that we have. But we have extended that thinking also into, into addressing the whole global information security uh, specialist community. And, and this is kind of partly been behind the thinking that what is our brand awareness? How can we extend the Nixu brand that we have in Finland into global markets? And, and you know, even though we are very good and, and great and, and, and so on, we understand our limitations in some, some cases. And maybe one of those limitations is that in order to get Nixus name in everyone's lips uh, in, in Northern European sphere might be a little bit a tough challenge. So we decided that, that addressing the cybersecurity community, getting the IT specialists uh, in every country to know Nixu, to like Nixu, to win their hearts is the kind of the first step toward building that, that reputation larger. And of course, it's very much tied into the recruitment strategy as well, that we need to be able to recruit good people, we need to keep them. So we need to build, build that position within that community and, and also to be you know, seen as a valuable actor and, and someone who is easy to work with. And of course, there is, you know, remembering the individualism of the young and so on, we need to build a company culture that's very inspiring and empowering uh, to Nixu and that, that the people like to work in Nixu. They feel that this is a company that is well led and, and managed and they have their own freedom, but also own responsibilities. <coughs> any, any questions or comments. And this of course applies, I've, I've been asked during the, during the years that do we, how do we get the best people around the world to come to Finland and work for Nixu? And, uh, and I've said that earlier we've had a very good, good strategy for that and that is the Finnish, Finnish women. So, so most of the international people that are working here, here in uh, in Finland are, are here because of their, their uh, spouse and so on. And we haven't really been looking abroad to bring people in. And that's been because of our small size. There haven't been that capability. Now we've actually started in looking, looking uh, expertise across the world and actually also relocating them to different sites within Nixu. So this is a, a way that we want to continue and we want to build, build that reputation and recruit. And of course, we are already very international. English is our corporate language and, and there is, I don't know how many how many nationalities, but over 20 anyway, so in, in Nixu currently. Then the more commercial uh, theme, the cybersecurity partner for digitalization. So, so how to become that partner that's helping our clients to become digital. And, uh, and of course, it means that we will target our sales and services at the digital transformation project for our customers. Um, last week, we, we published another other large cybersecurity partnership where that client, also a manufacturing client, wants to be data driven and pro provide also cybersecurity services as part of their services to their clients. And they are getting Nixu uh, to work as a strategic partner for them in, in creating that service capability and, and helping them to add the cybersecurity part into their own as a service model. And that's really a, a different value proposition. When, when you've been selling IT security traditionally, it's been a cost element. So you are selling it as a cost as a risk reducing cost element to the CIO, whereas now we are talking about building a new business to that client and helping them to uh, extend their business. And it's, you know, it's not, not competing. So when we are talking about this type of manufacturing companies on a global scale, we, any, anyways, that type of deals that they are making, we wouldn't be able to serve on our own. So, so that's really, really uh, kind of no risk type of, type of positions uh, for us to be working there. Uh, 
of course, enabling secure industrial IoT, what Alex will be talking, and digital identities will be the spearheads in this, this strategy. And a holistic services as a true cybersecurity partner, meaning that we should cover all the three layers as I described earlier. Questions, comments? And I think this actually is a, is a quite differentiator in a way that when I'm looking at, at other traditional cybersecurity companies, or so specialist cybersecurity companies, most of them are still addressing the corporate IT market. So, so that's the key message. And they are talking about the protecting the corporate network and doing red theming and what have you in that corporate network. Whereas, you know, we want to be moving, moving on to the kind of digital business side. Then our own internal operations and how do we di digitalize? I think every company needs to have a digital strategy and I think so, so does Nixu. So, so we don't want to be just a consultancy company selling the minds and hands of our consultants. So we need to be able to be data driven, meaning that that data that we are working on is collected somewhere and we get that data utilized and, and shared across all the Nixu ones first of all, but then also as a basis for our own services. And there is a, this is one of those investment areas that we've already been investing and are continuing to invest into our own platform. We call it OneVixu platform, which is the kind of the, our digitalization platform that, that we can work on and that collects the data from the work that we are doing and enables teamwork between different Nixu sites and so on. And we really hope to transform the kind of the consultancy phenomena through that that platform that it's not only sending a consultant there to do time and material, but being able to drive uh, services through through technological plat platform. And then of course, when we are building our own services, like the CDC service that's built on, on third party technologies. So we are not trying to invent the technologies ourselves. We think that in, in Silicon Valley, there is enough venture capital money poured into technology companies that we could ever be able to match match for those investments. So we, we won't have the money to invest in the technology in a way that is done in Silicon Valley. So the kind of safer strategy is to look for the best technologies and adapt those and, and sell those to our clients as a service model. Or when building a service, let's build it on something that is a winning platform for the future and then build at, adjust into the ecosystems of those, those platforms. <coughs> Questions? Comments? Please. How about Nixu name? How do you protect the Nixu brand in different countries? Uh, sorry. Yeah, so, so the question was about Nixu name and have we, have we protected the Nixu brand or, or trademark in different countries? Uh, we haven't. Uh, when operating in the US, we did a check, and of course, the, c the countries where we have now companies operating, I think we get some, some uh, protection through that, uh, but we haven't done any, any specific, specific protection means, means to kind of protect it yet, which I think is <laughs> that's a good point. Let's, let's consider that and uh, see. Obviously, this, uh, yes. More. Can you name or tell a little bit more about these global software platforms and which ones are you working with? Yeah, that's of course going to be different platforms for different services. But let's take example for, for example, GRC, which is a governance risk and, and compliance work. So the clients who are uh, building their own governance practices, uh, they are using different tools for it. And there are, there are lots of different tools around it. And you can buy, buy your own, own software and install it and, and use it on your own. But there are increasingly uh, as a SaaS offered services for that. And then, of course, there are global platforms like ServiceNow uh, that is providing ITSM, meaning the IT asset management software, is adding these GRC capabilities into it. And we have actually a case, case study in our, our uh, yearly review, I guess, where, where we discussed about building that GRC capability on top of the ServiceNow. And I think that is a good example that, that if we choose the GRC platform that we are working on, let's choose the uh, ServiceNow instead of a some local platform and so on. And then we can tap into that platform as well. I think cloud service, for example, Amazon Cloud is a good example of, of a uh, structure where there will be an ecosystem built on top of it. Salesforce is another other on the CRM side and, and so on. And again, there comes to the play of, of picking and choosing the right platforms 
where to build those services and how to be connected and how to provide value add on top of those, those platforms. And then expanding the market presents. So, so this we talked already. Uh, so in order to be the Northern European go-to partner for cybersecurity services, we obviously understand that that's probably not going to happen by only being present in, in Finland, Sweden, and Netherlands. So we need to open up new markets as well, and, and we need to be able to build that, that uh, presence in those areas. And, and so far we've noted that, that opening greenfield might not always be, be uh, or it's a slow and also costly way of doing it. So, so we are mostly looking into uh, MTA uh, or then strategic sales, sales as a way of opening th those, those uh, markets and having them as market entry platforms. And that, that work should, should continue when we find good companies that are cultural fits, fits to Nixu. And of course, there was an earlier question about the financing of those. And, and I guess right now we have some cash reserves. So, so depending on the company that we find, we either, either utilize those reserves or, or then we try to find other ways of financing, financing these deals. But the market is still very fragmented. So there are opportunities and, uh, to find. So where is, where is Nixu competitive differentiation when we are thinking of, of us in relation to global cybersecurity companies and, and what they are doing? And, and you can easily say that, well, we have a holistic service portfolio, but someone like IBM has a huge, huge service offering and they have nice slides and everything and bells and whistles. Uh, but where is our competitive differentiation against these type of companies? And of course, when you're looking at this traditional triangle, uh, whether it's price differentiation, definitely we are not the pr cheapest one and we don't intend to be, we are a premium provider. Whether it's a product differentiation, well, we don't have any clear spearhead of services. We are a holistic service offerer. So I hope that our quality is really good and the client appreciate it, but it's not our spearhead to be the product leader in, cyber in relation to cybersecurity companies. I guess in relation to generic players, we might be product differentiator as well. But the client intimacy, in especially in relation to global cybersecurity companies, in those markets where we have presence and we are near the clients, we most often have, have more people, we have more consultants available than these global players have, because most of their workforce is in the United States, typically. So uh, we are able to provide the client with that client intimacy, being near them, understanding their needs. And, and that is the kind of the core asset to which we are building, building our services on. And I think I've been earlier talking also about technology augmented services, which I mean that we need to have the advisory at the client. We need to have human presence at the client, working with the client, building the trust. And then we can install uh, technology services that are managed. And the Cyber Defense Center is a good example of that. So most of those cases we have won, they have gone to a client that we had already existing consulting relationship. And the client had the trust towards Nixu as well. And there's no, no stopping for us in creating new services that can be uh, sold to those clients as well. The first one we've actually, actually piloting right now is a Nixu multi-factor authentication service, also built on a third party third party technologies and uh, it's not as complicated as a Nixon Cyber Defense Center, but it's again a, a uh, managed service that can be easily, easily sold and, and deployed to the clients where we are also managing their security in, in other, other perspectives. And that's, that I see is the kind of the competitive differentiation again that we are, you know, not just selling through the pipe, but we have the trust from the client and from their, their work for us. And why do the clients finally choose Nixu? What, what's the answer when we are asking that, okay, why did you pick us? Where, where, where was the benefits in your eyes? Obviously still the kind of the exper experienced professionals, the talent of our people, that is still a very, very key thing. Even though we are not selling through CVs, we are not listing, listing people's CVs, but the reputation and experience of people. Working near the client, this client intimacy that I talked uh, about holistic service portfolio that we are able to offer more than just one specific branch of services. Because in every market, obviously, there is the cybersecurity boutiques that are really good penetration testers, or they are really good governance consultants, or they are really good identity access management consultants. But when we go to a client and tell that, hey, we want to be your partner, it's easier to work with just one partner, and you can get actually all of these services from us. That seems to work quite nicely. And also this 
this capability to deliver as a service. We've been doing this transformation and trying to make our projects be more service-based, to be offered as a service. We are also learning to be, as a consultancy organization, we are learning to be more service-oriented instead of you know, looking towards the end of the project. And that is a journey we are ongoing as well, but I think we are ahead of other, other competitors in, in that area. And then finally comes the trust in the brand, which obviously in Finland is, is really good already, and we are building that in the other markets as well. So, so we are only, only living by the Nixu brand, not, not looking to uh, utilize any, any other brands. And yes, we need to protect that name. Any questions? Please. There's a microphone. Which are the next countries you are planning to expand? So which, which are the next countries that we are, we are planning to expand? Uh, when you take the Northern European map and, and you look, look at where do we have <laughs> after dots already and where we don't we, I guess that is a, that is a, a good indicator. Uh, and we are looking, looking at all the markets. So, so it's, it's for us, it's more about where do we find the right partner. So, so if we do find a good company that has a cultural match and so on, I think that's more important than which, which market it is at that time. And then, of course, the kind of UK and Germany will be the bigger, bigger markets uh, that we need to look at. And then there are some markets which might not be strategically as important, let's say the other Nordic. Denmark, Norway, I think we can, we can easily, easily live without even. Uh, but Germany and UK, I think those are the markets where we need to be at some stage. And what, at what stage? I'm not going to give any, any answer, answer on that. And, and so this is, this is the you know, growth strategy, obviously, and, and growth demands investments. And, and as Janne showed on our EBITDA and so on, we have been putting those investments in place. Uh, so far, we haven't been making any, any uh, kind of real investments in a sense that we haven't depreciated or are not depreciating anything with the IFRS. We, we need to start doing that, that somewhat as well. Uh, but from in my eyes, the journey that we've been taking is that from 2015, 2017, we were in a kind of plan and build phases. In the first phases, not much happened. We were planning, and then there was rapid build up of, of where we are today. And I think in 2018, we are in a place where we need to establish what we have currently. We need to make sure that we act as one Nixu. We need to find the operational efficiency from there. Uh, but at the same time, we also need to lead the growth. So it's two-sided two-sided things uh, to kind of get, get the, uh, the, the uh, parts in balance and, and drive further growth. And then the question is that how long are we going to drive the growth? How long are we going to invest in that growth? And I get that asked quite a lot as well. And I'm always giving this vague, vague answer that I don't have any answer for it. I guess the question which our board of directors obviously needs to answer is how long is it feasible? How long can we grow fast enough that it's wise to invest into it? And that's why I put I, I would presume that it's 2020 20 something, so it's not 2019 when this period is it's probably a little bit longer when this market is open and there is no, no clear European leader. But when it seems that the market is mature enough, I think then it's time to leverage that one mix so where you know, we are integrated and we are working as one platform and, and can get, get the operational efficiency in, in a level where it needs to be as well. But getting there and then growing and opening new markets obviously has, has its costs as well. Questions, comments? A question regarding the M&A activity. Uh, how large could an, uh, uh, a typical M&A be or in how many people or in what kind of range would the, an M&A be? Yeah, so what would be a, a typical MTA range or what are we, or what are we looking at? Uh, right now, obviously, what we've done has been a, a kind of smallest companies, uh, the largest being, I think, actually Panorama Partners in, in the 2014 here in Finland. Uh, and then it's been on the range of, of, let's say, 20 to 30, 40 people. Uh, and I think that is a range of companies which are actually quite easy to find. So there are a lot of, lot of that size of companies and we kind of know how to, how to get them on board. Obviously, the challenge is that while we are growing larger, you know, in order to keep up the same pace in MTA, we would need to acquire more and more of those smaller companies. So in that regard, we are also interested in, in a little bit larger 
larger companies if we can find them and if the if the valuations are on feasible levels so we haven't set any clear goal uh, it could be i think we could could now we are in a size we have a little bit over 300 people so you know companies about 100 people if we could find them are still still feasible and uh, i think we still would have means of financing that sort of deal as well on your, on your growth during the next next few years what do you think is the key bottleneck is it is it getting enough uh, enough talent talent in or sort of uh, getting your processes scalable enough or what is the main hurdle probably not demand <laughs> yeah that's a good good question what is the main hurdle and and i i i agree i i think it's not going to be the demand um, but other than that, I think there are many hurdles and, and, and getting the talent in, getting the right people as, as described in the community, but definitely is a thing for us. Uh, and as a, a shortage of talent is happening and, and the recruitment is you know, heating, I, I'm only wishing that it's not overheating and, and so on. Uh, uh, then of course, getting this one next to operational, getting, getting the services aligned and so on. I think that's a grand goal that if we can make it happen, uh, it is a really, really grand goal and worth pursuing. But obviously, it's harder than, than just you know buying companies and keeping them independent and, and you know getting money in and, and so on. So, so I think that will definitely be a, a second hurdle, and that, that we need to be driving one one feet on the gas and one feet on the on the brake <laughs> pedal at the same time. I think. Uh, uh, and as, as a former uh, race driver, Mario Andretti used to say that if you feel in control, you are not going fast enough or something like that. But anyways, uh, I think the hurdles are there, there to be won and, uh, and we have a great team in place to, to make that happen. And, and the more I'm looking at the market and seeing what other companies are doing, I think there is no, no real you know, uh, certain winner or somebody who would be doing everything right. So definitely there is a possibility of, of making this happen. Okay, and, and when, you know, this is capital markets day, so I guess it's fair to be talking about Nixu as an investment and, and how I see it. Uh, and I guess this familiar slide to many of you as well, but when, when we look at things together, obviously growing cybersecurity market, and as noted before, the demand probably is not going to be the thing stopping, stopping us. Uh, then, of course, you know, we are a service company, which means that we are not, you know, fully scalable. We don't have the uh, hockey stick type of demand from selling licenses, but at the same time, it's relatively low risk. And, and now with the venture capital money going to product companies, I think that would be quite hard to pick and choose the right, right position. Uh, we are focused. We have a credible growth strategy. I think we have proven, proven our, our, let's say, credibility in, in being able to execute on our strategy during the past four years and uh, and uh, that's that adds some credibility and of course still the market is fragmented so there is a possibility to grow utilizing MTA as well and of course for us it's always because we can grow organically as well it's always a matter of looking that which way is smartest and, and what gives the best best owners value value in that sense and uh, we have good governance we have a quite distributed ownership we have independent board of directors and, and quite liquid share, share as Janne, Janne showed as well. So, so I think those are, from an investor perspective, at least I would be interested and I am interested as an investor in Nixu, Nixu about these things. Good. Uh, thank you for my part. Today's Kimmo. That's true. I promise to say reasons for, for our main list. So, so you know, you, well, we said that we are aiming aiming to transfer from the first north to the main list, stock exchange, and, and what are the reasons for that? Uh, that's all related to the becoming more international as well. So, so last fall, we did the uh, equity round and raised capital where we actually got more international in investors coming in. I think that was share of 60%, if I remember correctly, came from international investors. And that was part of our attempt to make us more international, not, not Finnish company anymore. And I think becoming a true stock exchange listed company in that sense is also important that it enables more investors to invest into Nixu. And, uh, and of course, there's, we've noted that there are some rules and regulations also which we need to abound. So maybe we are more quality oriented also after following all of these very nice rules and regulations that, that the stock is forcing us to, to obey. Uh, but I think, I think that's, that's part of our growth, growth journey as well, to be, be a, a truly stock exchange listed 
company and, uh, and uh, possibility also to raise capital if we need it for, for those larger MAT cases if we find them. Good. Thank you for my part. There is still Alexander's presentation, but just you know, today's takeaways at this stage. So uh, what's happening? Digitalization and increasing threats are driving forces in the cybersecurity market. What we are going to do for that is to focus on the uh, business digitalization and then put, put our efforts into that, which we have already been doing, but we see that that growth is there and that's definitely a, a place, place to be. And I think that's still a position that's largely unclaimed. And industrial IoT is one of the specific areas where, where we can differentiate and where we have actually quite good starting points. There's still time, time for a question after Alexander's presentation. So without no further ado, uh, Alexander, thank you. So I guess we're all set. No coffee break needed. No. Oh, oh, okay. So hi from my side as well. Uh, my name is Alex Vada. I'm uh, responsible for our industrial IoT portfolio development as well as uh, cooperation between different Nixus, different uh, units, be it sales business, business units delivering the services to make sure that what we put on the market and how we deliver it is, is, very, is consistent to the uh, overall Nixu strategy. Uh, before, before hitting the industrial IoT part of Nixu, uh, I was in Cyber Defense Center. So basically when Cyber Defense Center was at its very earliest stages, so helped to commercialize it, as well as uh, uh, led the role of sales in our uh, monitoring and incident response services. The topics I'm going to um, um, touch today is, is our, uh, how does the footprint in IoT and industrial IoT market, um, as well as how our customers, our clients, when going through digital transformation, how cybersecurity is affecting that. And um, at the end, we will uh, take a glimpse on what does it mean to partner with Nixu. So, uh, obviously, there was a lot of uh, a lot of discussion. I saw also on social media the um, contract we've been awarded recently. There was also one before that. I think that that pretty much summarizes that why we are aiming at this market or on this segment because it's big. The changes customers, clients need to go through they are significant, and of course when going through significant changes, you need to have a reliable partner, holistic, reliable partner. And therefore, the uh, deals are, of course, completely different. So going to history, uh, Nixus' first IoT um, assignment started nearly 10 years ago on telecom equipment as well as uh, mobile industry, uh, obviously Nokia. But uh, I think the key takeaway we learned there then is that you are actually able to make secure products that are connected to the internet and that can perhaps even learn something about you. And if you think about today's IoT industry and, and business models, those are the key driving factors. So having smart products, doing smart things, learning about you to deliver you the best possible customer experience. Today, we, are, we have expanded our presence on, in different markets. And somehow it went to the critical or safety critical uh, infrastructure industry. So we're working in energy sector, oil, gas, manufacturing, automotive, industrial components, as well as heavy machinery. So basically anything that moves is smart, it can be in the air or on the land. <coughs> uh, our focus today is uh, twofold. So primary, we are focusing currently on the heavy machinery as well as industrial components or industrial automation, mainly because there are very, very heavy investments made on that in that area, but also because there's a lot of, typically a lot of cybersecurity debt 
I'm going to touch base later on. But then, of course, we are working, and, and, it, and our target is also to meet the requirements and, and, and fulfill the needs of our other uh, significant customers in the fields of telco as well as uh, automotive and even consumer consumer electronics, because on that area, there's a lot of innovation from security perspective. There's a lot of innovation that's happening to be made that can be utilized later on on the industrial market. So if we think about IoT, right, so what does it mean? I tried to create as, as uh, simple picture as possible, and it ended up being very complex. Sorry about that. But in general, you have different users with different access to devices or to some digital apps that can control devices that have physical impact. As an example, or a couple examples, you may have a uh, industrial component in a manufacturing plant that is able to predict that it's going to break. Once that prediction is made, a maintenance person goes on the, on the manufacturing site Imagine he could, he could uh, take a helmet with an uh, augmented reality display, put it on, the helmet identifies this person as a maintenance person and starts navigating that person to the correct place in the manufacturing site and even helps that person to uh, fix the machine. All that happening automatically. As a second use case, it, imagine walking down the road towards your car and the car identifies you as you and not your spouse or your child. And what if that car could even identify your mood today? And based on that, when starting the car, you would be automatically in a sport mode, echo mode, or comfort mode, and the car would play your favorite music. So in these cases, from cybersecurity perspective, right, in, in traditional any traditional company would say that's a nightmare, and partially that is. <laughs> but it doesn't mean that uh, nothing can be done. And a lot of, a lot of uh, how would I say, a lot of, a lot of innovations around these new, how would I say, functionalities as well as new business models can be developed and is, are developed all the time. <clears throat> also, if we think about having these type of concepts, we are, uh, we cannot explicitly say that this is an R&D issue. There's IT systems involved, there's operations involved. Of course, there's a lot of R&D involved as well. So that, of course, puts a burden on a company that is going through real digital transformation. And what we are saying in, 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 to our clients, what we are delivering, or the way we are delivering uh, our services to our partners is that if our partner is connected, it has to be secure. <clears throat> we'll come back to that a little bit later. But now, after, after, after these a couple use cases, let's think about digital transformation in general, what that means. We have typical product companies becoming service companies. They're trying to still sell their products, but through different service models, adding extra value to the customer in order to get the most revenue over the period, or over a period of time of, of that product's life cycle. What that requires is that those product companies that were typically hardware companies have to apply software. They have to become software companies as well. That is very new to them. It's not that it's just that they, they are connected to internet. There's, their products need to become smarter and connected. And of course, having this type of heritage where they're coming from, where those companies are coming from, the understanding of cybersecurity and the demands, requirements for cybersecurity, understanding the internet is not on the same level as your highly digitalized companies already. That started from the very, uh, how would I say, started maybe five years ago doing some AI platforms or, or services on cloud. And that, of course, having this type of transformation, which is demanding by itself, of course, that calls for a partner from cybersecurity perspective, because everyone understands cybersecurity is, is important, especially if you are in a safety-critical domain. If you have a toaster that gets DDoSed every now and then, well, yes, it's a PR problem, but 
not if people would die. So <clears throat> the main drivers for cybersecurity partnerships and, and, and main drivers that, how would I say, where, where, we, uh, uh, where we bring value and, and, and to trying to bridge that depth or gap between the actual product or service as well as its security state. That, well, first, it's threat landscape, understanding the threat landscape, because it's big. We, we heard Andre's, uh, Andre's presentation when basically what happens when you actually are able to penetrate into a product or operations. The effects are completely different at that point. You affect masses. Also, customer awareness. So if, if today, if, if, you are, uh, if a company wants to sell smart industrial component to a uh, energy sector, any, any site, any production site that would take it, there would be a requirement paper with more than 100 security requirements. And those requirements would touch not just the product uh, features, but also how that product is managed. So those security requirements will, will actually consider the entire organization of a company that tries to sell products on the market. And that that's, is a, one of the biggest drivers for external help on meeting those requirements. Internal co capabilities, their uh, development, as well as uh, fulfilling, uh, fulfilling the, the gaps with people or with technologies or with services. When you have a, a uh, trusted partner, there it doesn't matter what that gap is, is it, gets, it gets filled. And I, of course, one of the biggest ones is the legislation and standards. So the couple cases I've mentioned just earlier, let's take, for example, the automotive case. Uh, GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation. A car understands your mood. Most likely there's, there could be heartbeat data. There could be data knowing where are you coming from. It's just that every time you're coming out of work after 6 p.m., you're, you're mad and you just want to drive hard or whatever. But that's sensible, sensitive data. And regulations understand that. This is why they are developing, as well as standards for, uh, specifically for industrial internet or industrial components. And uh, helping first, being part of those, how would I say, standards, taking, taking uh, our, uh, how would I say, step there in, in helping to create those standards, being part of, of uh, innovational projects, as well as uh, helping our customers to meet them. That's where the uh, partnership where, where the partnership actually uh, uh, starts. But in order to succeed, uh, despite partnership or, or not, in order to succeed in, 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 in uh, how to say, breaching the gap or fulfilling today's cybersecurity requirements on industrial internet market, the security, cybersecurity needs to be taken as a strategic initiative for a company. So it has to be driven, driven and perhaps even measured by executive management. Also, since it's not just an R&D problem, it's a company problem, operations, IT, development office. Cybersecurity needs to be holistic. It needs to be a mix of processes, uh, contracts, technical capabilities, maintenance. And also one of the reasons why we've chosen the industrial internet and, and, uh, or industrial automation as well as the uh, heavy machinery market is basically because the lifespan of those products and services, it's very long. So 15 years, it's not a long life cycle for a product in those areas. And cybersecurity, five years from now, is expected to be completely different. You have machine learning, AI, bad guys will utilize those, good guys will utilize those. So something that we're doing right now, it's known that it's not going to be enough five, six years from now. Hence, you have to have a continuous way of improving security while your products are on the field. So, <clears throat> moving forward, what is a um, Nixu cybersecurity partnership? Well, today most of our customers, they are still in, uh, how to say, in the phase of digitalization. So they're not perhaps fully digitalized. They have products on markets that are connected to the internet, but there will be, of course, more to come and better to come. So one of, those, uh, one of the, the uh, components of our partnership is to strategically advise our customers 
how their future innovations would be secured. So before, they, before anything comes out of the R&D pipeline to the market, there is at least established processes how to do things securely. There are processes how to, uh, how to make sure that if a, a, a product gets breached, that it gets mitigated from PR perspective, from, from regulational perspective, from technical perspective. Aligning organization to meet the threats, mitigate them, and to meet the cybersecurity standards is what we're going in this first, first phase. The second phase is being the ecosystem cybersecurity backbone, which basically goes into the operational mode of cybersecurity. First off, making sure that cybersecurity is part of product quality. It's an internal, integral part of product quality, as well as making sure that once the uh, products are on the market, they are updated. We know when they are, or customer knows when they are vulnerable, and customer can detect re as real time as possible breaches or breach attempts in order to do something about them. So, and, and why we are able to do this, right? It's, it's, it's because, well, as Petra mentioned, it's holistic approach. We are capable of looking at cybersecurity close, across silos on the technical perspective, compare those or relate those to, to administrative cybersecurity, which also leads to scalability. We need to scale as customer business scales. The demands can increase, decrease, but they will be always there. And of course, that, that goes towards, uh, especially on the ecosystem backbone part, that goes to having uh, scalable services. I'll talk about those in a minute, minute. Continuous scalable services in order to meet the, uh, the uh, customer and market demands for cybersecurity throughout the product lifespan. The second thing is, of course, being customer focused. So being customer focused basically means that being near the customer, understanding the customer in order to serve the customer the best way possible. And when it comes to reliability, is, is, is again something that Petri already touched on. So it's not about having good Pekka or good Ari. It's about brand. Everything that comes from Nixu is top notch. And that is, of course, supported by keeping the talent level up all the way. So <clears throat> when going, if we would go a little bit deeper into what is delivered as part of our partnership, cybersecurity partnership. So the services that we are delivering, some of them are, have, have been there for, for, for years. Some of them have just been created. Some of them, for example, digital, digital identity management is, is currently in the pilot, in the pilot mode. So, our, uh, uh, our, our services are, are, are spanning from the very first part you're thinking about something. So having a product or service on paper to make sure that there's the architecture decisions you are making, the uh, business decisions you are making, they're on par with cybersecurity. Security engineering services are mostly in making sure that your products are secured from uh, as default. So basically, you have security features in within your products. In industrial automation space, it's, it's, already, <coughs> it's already known that if you have a, a smart device that has limited amount of power as well as computational power, there is no off-the-shelf products currently that just you just plug them in and they make products secure. Security needs to be taken care of from the very first day of development. And yes. So not yes. Yeah. Well, operation maintenance. Actually, in my previous slides, I had maintenance and decommission there. <laughs> yes. Right. Yes. It's, it actually it's, it goes even beyond that. It goes towards maintenance mode, decommission mode, even, and making that securely. Yes. Absolutely. So it goes that way. It's just that. 
there's graphics and there's the content. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. But 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 also having adding adding uh, security as part of product overall quality. And you might have heard buzzword word called DevSecOps. So it's it's a it's a it's a it's a in our case it's a service from two components. One component is making sure that the process your developers are developing is consistent with, uh, or is consistent from cybersecurity perspective. So you have certain quality gates that require certain security uh, to be implemented. Would it be c features, audits, whatnot? The second part is automation technologies that you embed as part of your product development. So you can automatically ensure that some baseline of product cybersecurity is met. And if it's not met, you are able to do changes in that at the very earliest stage. In hardware development, or in hardware products, embedded software products, we have uh, noticed that once we, we receive a, a, a product for penetration testing, many times we find, uh, we find issues that are related to, say, architecture. And once your product is, is at its very late stage of development, there is a, uh, how would I say, to fix those vulnerabilities, to fix those fine issues. That usually is months of work, which basically can potentially delay the uh, time to market. So in testing world, they're, we, they're t talking about shifting left. So having as much of testing, as much of quality at the very earliest stage of product development. And security should be there as well. And this is where this buzzword comes from. And this is a service that we are offering to our cu uh, customers. Product security incident response, a very obvious one. So everyone understands that if, if you have hundreds of thousands of cars and, and, and the data of millions of customers, potential breaches are massive. So there's data breach, there's product recalls that can happen, which costs money. And of course, no matter how much you invest, you have to be prepared to face these type of events. And this is where we are helping with our clients. Device identity management. So how do how does the car uh, uh, how does the car uh, figure out that I am I and not someone else in a secure way? That is something that we're helping our clients with. And of course, cyber defense center. When the products are on the market, how to make sure that there is a mechanism to A, understand when the product becomes vulnerable in order to fix the vulnerabilities before the product is breached, and as well as how to understand when the product is, or when there is attempt to breach the product in order to mitigate those. So. Yes, uh, but what that leads, what this allows us when having this holistic view backed up by highly, highly skilled professionals, being part of R&D, being part of IT operations, strategic advisory, having scalable services, really allows us to innovate together with our customers, as well as product lead or, or industry leaders in their own field. So, for instance, with Danfoss Drives, we, were, we won the... Uh, Innovation Security Innovation Award that considered basically having embedded security as part of a uh, or embedded pl or embedded security platform, and of course the news that that you heard today this was this is this one is a bit older a bit smaller, and, and today we we've won the uh, 3.9 million euro contract for, from uh, for also from IoT perspective. So in summary, being able to uh, serve our customer holistically, making sure that security is efficient on par with the regulations, the threats, and the risk appetite, that allows Nixu to uh, be their competition no matter where do they came from. Would they came from cybersecurity, would they came from IT security or just product development? There is not too many companies out there in the world that can address security from this holistic point of view to make sure that digital transformation, or to ensure digital transformation success of a client. 
Any questions? <clears throat> Please. Uh, could you elaborate uh, money-wise on, on, you said scalable a, a number of times, but do you have, for instance, say you would get Volkswagen Group or some big automaker or other high volume product maker, is there a component that you can get a charge per vehicle or per, per toaster out there or any, any other sort of uh, volume based mm. compensation? Yeah, so money-wise, I think how, how Nixu makes it in its income out of that, I think this is something that, that I would not like to address at this point of time. But historically, we've been doing that, the, this type of, of, of work of, of, um, on, on, different, di on, on a number of different entities as, as uh, resource hiring, more or less. But this is changing all the time. Any other questions? All right. Anything from the internet? No? Thank you. <laughs>Hey, thank you, thank you, Alex. And uh, his presentation concludes concludes our our set for today. I think now we have uh, the official reserved time for questions and answers. So, so uh, from also from the internet during the webcast, if we have questions, then then we are able to take them, and we are we are clearly ahead of our our timing as well. So, so there is a good time time for questions and comments, and maybe maybe continuing on Alex careful answer to the past past question uh, I think uh, it's obvious that we are at least right now we are not in a model where we would be you know that would be licensing of our technology as part of somebody else's technology and, and getting getting the revenue stream from that but as according to our strategy we are moving towards a service type of, of uh, delivery model and I think that if we would get a new services running, which we are intending to run, they would somehow be tied into the volumes that we are, let's say, protecting or securing or so on. So, so it might not be a technology component that we sell as part of, of clients' products, but we might be monitoring, let's say, IoT accesses from some components. And, and obviously, we don't have that type of revenue streams in place right now, but that is the kind of the expectation that we could, could build in into that type of things. Let's see how, how those negotiations with Volkswagen go. And if they <laughs> we have a few questions from our members. The first one is, uh, do you see difference in maturity level in digitalization or IoT in your different markets? And how does that affect the Nixus strategy? Yes, uh, maybe Alex, do you want to Sorry, take that? I, I you I lost your I microphone. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, do you see difference in maturity level in digitalization or IoT in your different markets, and how does that affect your strategy? Uh, majority level, I think, is, is uh, something that would be great to be explained a bit more. But the thing is that uh, we see we see heavy investments going on right now everywhere, and in terms of our client base, most of our client base are coming from industri industrial industrial automation as well as well heavy machinery but with our roots we will always be working where the innovation is because to fulfill the uh, needs of industrial automation space you need to innovate because there's not a lot of things out there so we definitely see that one of the more focused areas of these two will be industrial automation and heavy machinery at least for now and of course, in that, that respect, uh, the strategic focus of Northern Europe is, is quite matching because here we have a, uh, lots of manufacturing industry companies, both in, in Finland, Sweden, of course, in Germany, uh, also in the Netherlands. So, and I think in all of those areas that these investments are taking place and, and industry 4.0, uh, uh, 4.0 industry in Germany, for example, is also a very, very kind of, let's say, ongoing moment even before Finland woke up into this, this industrial IoT matter. Thank you. Then I've, I've got another one from our viewers. Uh, 
Do you see any impact on Nixu from growing competition from technology vendors? Yeah, if I, if I take that question, I think I kind of addressed that a little bit on, on the kind of uh, competitive advantages of, of, uh, of being near the client and having the client trust. I, I obviously, that there will be different competition. And of course, the hard part from our perspective is that the technology vendors can subvent their services business or consultancy business from, from the revenues from the uh, sale of their technologies. So, and of course, pay pay higher salaries maybe because of that. And that's, that's of course, you know, our disadvantage. Then our advantage is that, that at least what our clients are telling us, that when they want to have advisory, when they want to have partner, it's kind of hard to receive that advisory from somebody who is, at the other hand, wanting to sell their technologies. So, so if you want to really compare that what technologies you wish to use, do you really want to get that advice from a company that has their own stack of technologies? And I think that, that will be our, our competitive advantage. Please. On, on the industrial IoT clients, if we take an example then on, on Nordic heavy machinery, say Volvo mining equipment, would then Volvo be your client or would, would the end client be the, the operator of the mines? It's, it's very normal, so when, when we're talking about energy, for example, as our market, industrial, which is industrial automation. So, of course, one of these, our client side is component manufacturers. But then, of course, how to implement those as part of a bigger ecosystem, which could be your power plant, for example. That is, of course, one of our target audiences as well. That's, that's also a little bit of beauty in our business model is that we can act on different parts of the value chain. And this is from tr traditional security, let's say the financial or the payment industry where the pay payment card security standard took place, place in starting in 2006. Uh, it was quite typical that we were acting as a consultant in different parts of the value chain. So we were acting as a consultant for the technology vendors who were building these PCI DSS compliant solutions. We were working as consultants for the retailers who were buying those solutions. And we were working as consultants for the banks who were demanding uh, that PCI DSS compliance is, is fulfilled. And again, this was because of being you know, agnostic and neutral and, and you know, deemed trustworthy, so to say. And I would expect the same to happen in that, that uh, sense in this IoT world. And I think that also gives our consultants the edge because they can work at different phases of the value chain. So then they can provide the clients with an insight that somebody who is only on that industry vertical might not be able to provide. So actually, even, even uh, answer more to your question. So if you think about Cyber Defense Center, Cyber Defense Center today monitors industrial control system environments. But with this uh, latest deal, if you look at the specifics of it, one of the aspects is actually control the components or monitor the components. Good, more questions. Keep them coming because we don't have the food coming yet. So <laughs> now it's really good time to invent a lot of, lot of good questions. And we have Andre here as well, if you have more, more Kubernetes hacks or type of questions which you, which you have come up during, during these presentations. Nothing, nothing from the web. No, there's. Please. I could uh, ask about the scalability of your services. How have you been uh, building the organization to facilitate uh, the growth? Yeah. So how how are we able to scale? And and of course, the organizational growth is one part of the scalability. And of course, the traditional uh, consultancy services or human-based services they are of course heavily dependent on on the growth of headcount and, and getting new people in. And that's, of course, the game we know. And, uh, and we are recruiting people, both from very experienced cybersecurity talent and also people around the cybersecurity industry, so, so typically people who are, who are working in IT industry but have a passion for cybersecurity or interest in cybersecurity. And then when they join us and work in our teams, they're actually quite fast in picking up those skills needed if they are fast learners. And then, of course, the junior recruitment, which has traditionally been harder in our field because there hasn't been that, that good uh, education leading, leading straight into this business when compared to, let's say, financial audit or law or so on. 
Uh, but I think that, that is getting better as well as society is, is getting those in place. But that's, that's for the consulting part. Then, of course, when we come to scalable services in general and, and so on, then we are not so much tied into the uh, human workforce anymore. So let's take the Cyber Defense Center, for example. There are the technology licenses there in place, which can be uh, increased by just you know, pulling the switch and then providing more, more uh, bang for the buck from, from those pipes. And then we have the monitoring center with a few people. But we, now that we have the 24-7 operations in monitoring in place, we have the people sitting during the Sunday, Sunday night watch. We don't need to add more people for every client. So that's scalable in its own right. But also that part is, is, has been growing with such a huge speed that the, the profitability of those operations is still not on the scalable level. So we are still below the consultancy, traditional consultancy level of profitability in that business because we are scaling up so fast that business as well. So once we get that in a, in a stable manner, so to say, then, then that becomes scalable. And that's different from the human, human workforce scalability. Anyone else cares? Yes. Yes, uh, coming back to the acquisitions and the uh, strategy uh, there, what can you say about, uh, I mean, uh, what comes to profitability, for example? Is it important that the companies are profitable and, and, uh, and uh, how easy is, is it for you to get access to the, the client uh, base of the, the company before you do an acquisition and, and so forth? Mm. Yeah, o overall, when we are looking at the, the acquisition targets, obviously it needs to be a strategic fit in a way of what they are doing and, and what type of services they are providing. Uh, then comes the cultural fit, that they are operated in a similar manner, the people are led in a similar manner, that we can expect them to fit, fit our culture here. Uh, and then, of course, the clientele that they are having, I think that is increasingly important. And, uh, and we, we haven't done much kind of DD in a way that will the clients accept us or not, because that's always always a little bit tricky when, when doing the acquisition. But if there is a certain, like a, the biggest client that represents a certain percentage of the client, then we have done, done that as a part of the DD that the client approves, approves the acquisition. Uh, so far with the clients, it has worked quite nicely. So we've managed to keep all the clients. No clients have, you know, removed their, their clientship because of Nixu, Nixu buying that company. And, and it's, it's been more like we've been able to open, open these clients up for other services. So having cross-selling taking place, especially in Sweden. So that's been, that's been really, really nice thing. Uh, yeah. And then the profitability of these companies, obviously we, we'd like to buy profitable companies. Uh, at the same time, when you are buying these smallest uh, companies, the profitable, profitability levels are not always on the same level as as we would have our standard operations, so to say. And that's, that's mainly because, uh, for example, in Sweden, the companies are typically operating in a resource hiring mode. So they are you know, a team of consultants where the people are sitting at the client 100% of the time, hopefully, and, and sending money back, back home uh, for their work. Uh, and with that type of operating model, of course, the daily rates or the price rates for these consultants are lower than what we are typically charging from our services. So when we are taking over these type of companies, we gradually want to move them in team-based delivery, which drops the utilization rate. But at the same time, we need to raise the price rates with the clients. And we've been successful in raising those, but that's, of course, that's also not immediate effect that we can say to the client, and the next day after acquisition, your rates are now 30% higher, by the way. And and uh, let's, let's continue the business. So, so it is a overall journey, like part of the integration process that we are doing, doing these steps. And I guess needless to say, the more profitable the acquisition target is, the nicer it is for us. <laughs> up on uh, that one, what about the multiples that you are paying and how do you keep the uh, key personnel? Yeah, uh, so the, if you look at the acquisitions that we have done so far, we've been managed to pay let's say reasonable multipliers so they've been around one times revenue uh, rate and all of them have been profitable profitable a little bit different levels but profitable anyways uh, and then of course we we are growing so so we invested there that profitability into the growth in that that market as well as for the key players in the market we are looking for companies that have uh, owners like andre who want to join the family who have a motivation of, of getting into part of this, who believe in what Nixu is doing and, and who want to continue 
as part of Nixu doing it. They might see that they have, you know, they have struggles in, in growing their own company in their own right or so on. So they see that now, now is the time to do something and, and that's, that's why they join. Uh, we have not extensively used earnout models because we want to integrate these companies into, into one Nixu. And if we would have like strict earnouts in place, then of course that would limit the capability of, of uh, getting together and uh, really integrating the operators. But that's all of these are like, let's say, planning rules that we are able to change every time we do, do things. So it, of course, depends quite a lot on the, on the target company. Okay, thank you. So maybe I will continue from here. <laughs> so uh, about the geographical locations, you mention all the time that you are focused on the Northern Europe. Still, you have a site on the US also. So what are the guys doing there and what <laughs> how many are there? Are you planning to grow the headcount there also? Wasn't, wasn't America and China part of, part of the Northern Europe as well, I mean. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a site in Bo uh, Boston or near, near Boston. Uh, that site, site came to us through, through uh, the acquisition of the ESSC that we did one year ago. And that's a service center supporting certain American, American clients. And there is less than 10 people, people in that site. So it's not a huge site. Then we also had an opportunistic venture into Silicon Valley. Uh, where one of our, our principal consultants was, was for a year. He actually came back this, this fall, so this spring, thanks to uh, Trump's visa, visa legislation, so it was hard to renew the visas there. Uh, but also that, that uh, selling, Greenfield selling there wasn't that successful as we thought. So, so we are still having that operation. We are continuing those client relationships, but we are not heavily investing into that part anymore. And then we are also having a sales, sales presence in China uh, addressing Chinese companies mainly looking to enter the European, European market. And I would call that if we, our strategy is to Northern Europe and our, our main locations are going to be in Northern Europe, then these are the opportunistic areas which are part of finding out where the innovation is. As Alex said, I think Silicon Valley and China are actually on the digitalization side providing many of the innovations and we need to be aware of what's happening. Uh, and that's, that's what we are doing. But the kind of the main expansion will happen in Northern European area according to the strategy. As we've seen from the mask example, for example, the financial impacts your clients can be huge when the sort of things go wrong. And at the same time, you want to have sort of broader and broader sort of uh, responsibility and sort of advisory with your clients. So where is your sort of uh, liability if you have a sort of uh, advisory role, role and are trying to keep your clients safe and still something happens? Mm, yeah, um, the, the, it's kind of obvious that when we've been go growing from advisor, uh, from auditor to advisor to implementer to holistic service provider, we've uh, increased our risk perspective uh, towards our services, definitely towards the clients because we are becoming more business critical for them. We are still not in a process where we would guarantee our client's safety or so on. So if something happens, we would be liable for, for that. Uh, that's not the case. But obviously, as we are entering the services business, we are also promising uh, typical SLAs where we provide the service and how will that service be operated and how do we fulfill that and so on. That's, that's one part of the risk that if we are not able to fulfill the service, then, then there are sanctions, which are still you know, manageable and, and not so huge. Uh, then comes maybe the data, data uh, law sanctions or liability sanctions. Now, especially with GDPR, we are processing our clients' personal data as well. And, uh, and that's, of course, somehow limited and we have our insurances, but I think that is a big challenge that if, if the uh, personal data that we are processing somehow gets, gets breached, for example, then, then of course there are liabilities in that. Good questions. Anyone else? Continuing sort of on, on uh, Volvo or s volume theme, if you, as you said, you do a lot of testing of embedded software, and and I guess it's for for IoT devices or industrial devices. Um, do you also are you able to install some kind of security patch that would sort of tie in the client, the end client of a say a Volvo machine, to prefer your 
services then going forward if you can install some kind of patch into that embedded software so <coughs> typically when it comes to patches so uh, patches are done by the r&d organizations themselves this is something that they are not willing typically to uh how to say give out and they have the best knowledge of their product but uh, having said that they do require assistance in terms of defining what is the right patch how to do that carrying the patching carrying on with the patching is is, is something that typically companies want to do themselves but understanding what that patch might be as then uh, as well as verification that the patch actually works these are the most, how would I say, uh, normal use cases where a client would require our support. Thanks. Good, we are getting, getting questions. I was about to say that I'm not going to push you anymore, but it's, it's good that if there are... Okay, coming. one question. Is <laughs> I was uh, curious what comes to pricing. I mean... Uh, uh, as you said earlier here that uh, some years ago this was more nice uh, nice to have but uh, now it's starting to be very crucial for for the company's operations and uh, we also had some examples here so what can I say uh, what, what what can I say about uh, pricing and uh, and uh, in this situation and going forward mm -hmm. There might be might be clients watching this so I don't know if I dare to answer answer anything anything here but um, yeah, uh, I guess we've always been able to to enjoy on a let's say higher price levels than traditional IT consultancy or, or so on. So so because of the niche nature and specialist nature in that, and obviously we are all the time raising our prices. Having said that, uh, there is still <laughs> the kind of the competition <laughs> in free market. The competition still works, and and there is definitely competition. So there is no kind of. Uh, you know, free bill that you know just just put any any price on that, and, and you are you are free to go. So so we need to look in order to increase our our profitability. We still need to look into these scalable elements, selling value instead of hours, and and so on. Uh, I would say that in pricing level in, in Finland we are we are in let's say acceptable levels, which we of course want to raise all the time. Uh, but then in in Sweden and Netherlands we still definitely need have a possibility with the brand recognition and, and the growth, we have lots of opportunities in raising, raising the price level there. Okay, if no further questions on, on front of the, all the audience, I guess uh, thank you everyone for being here, also for our webcast viewers and this recording will be available at our website, uh, if not today, then, then hopefully tomorrow. And uh, now I guess we have some, some gifts for, for you when you are leaving. We will have food served here. Hanna, how do you want to do the division into the Cyber Defense Center visit? I think that we have, right, we have uh, around 80 participants joining the Cyber Defense Center. So if there is someone who hasn't yet signed to the NDA form, so we will be closed or five times the NDA forms. So I do think that we need to have two groups. Yeah. But how do you want to divide the groups? Huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but those who are who are going, then yes. then let's yeah. Yes. So okay, let's let's uh, the 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 Hanna, Hanna goes to yes. the door, and those nine first who want to join us, the first cyber defense center, go go to Hanna. Now, thank you everyone for for this event. <laughs>